evening service, um, and that's for your information. In the 2 o'clock service, we'll be taking some hymn requests, and so uh, you might, uh, not during the message, but you might want to look some up, uh, and we'll sing, we'll, we usually sing a couple verses of each request, um, and that'll be during the, uh, during the 2 o'clock service, as well as some special music um, during that time, too. Uh, this Wednesday night, like I said, there will be a pretty good group that will be gone for uh, junior and senior camp, but there will be a church service here on Wednesday night, 6.30, and uh, there's a treat for you. Uh, Brother Steve Trask, our missionary to Brazil, is going to be preaching here on Wednesday night, and he and I have been communicating back and forth by email, and I've been trying to help him find some material as he translates his message from Portuguese into English. So if there's a problem with that, you can blame me for that, okay? I gave him the wrong English words or something. But uh, anyway, uh, Brother Trask and Miss Marilyn, such a blessing, faithful servants of the Lord. And I know you'll, uh, you'll love hearing uh, from Brother Trask preach the Word of God. That'll be this uh, Wednesday evening. All right, if everybody has found your place in uh, Philippians chapter 3, then uh, let me ask you to do this. Mark that with something, your finger or a bookmark or uh, maybe your Bible is equipped with these little hangy-downy things. And one of, the, one of the kids last Sunday showed me they got a new Bible and he was proud of the fact it had two hangy-downy things in it. And then he had to rub it in. Preacher, yours only has one. So, uh, and he was right. He was right. I, I have a one ribbon Bible, and he had a two-ribbon Bible. Uh, but mark that place because uh, in just a minute we're going to look at some other scriptures and then come back and actually finish up this morning um, in Philippians uh, chapter uh, 3. How many of you have ever uh, been in a situation where you've seen someone behave in a certain way or you've heard them speak or heard their accent, and you thought to yourself, that person's not from around here. Anybody ever had that happen before? Yeah. Uh, this um, past, over the weekend, we were at my uh, uh, brother's house, and we were sitting around outside and just fellowshipping and talking, and my daughter uh, was just telling about when she was over in Kentucky at a youth camp over there that she went with my brother and sister-in-law to, and um, she said uh, <laughs> she, she just came right out with speaking like they talk over there. I'd never heard my daughter do that before. I didn't know she had Kentucky in her. I should have known better, but it was in there. And so, and it just flowed right out. Like there was, it, it startled me. I think it startled other people to just hear this Kentucky uh, pour out of her. And in some ways it was startling. In some ways I, it was so refreshing. I thought I was home for a second. But she would refer to being at that camp that week. And it seemed like everybody that, that came up to her said, you're Jody's kid. Uh, just like that right there. And uh, so that was, uh, that was kind of, uh, it just kind of brought me back to home. Uh, being around people from Kentucky, and we have some here today, uh, it just takes me back home. Um, I've, uh, whether willfully or uh, accidentally, lost uh, some of the accent. One time I said I've lost it all. Someone corrected me after I said that. No, you haven't. Uh, but I have lost some of the accent because I've been gone for 26 years now. But I'm just going to tell you, it's still home. And sometimes I still find myself uh, referring to that as home and referring to the way people do things out here. And people look at me like, what do you mean out here? And what I mean by that is, I've lived here 26 years. I lived there 17 years. But in a lot of ways, that's still home and here is still away from home. Now, I, I, I do consider this home, and I, I don't ever want to live anywhere else. Uh, being quite honest with you, to tell you the truth, it is home for all of my kids, which is another weird thought. Because I, I think of my kids, and this is the only home they've ever known. 
Uh, I'll talk about going home and, and like they ought to know what I'm talking about. But when they go to Kentucky, they're leaving home. I'm going home. And, and, and it's a little bit different. But when I, when I do get into Kentucky, a lot of times I'm reminded, yeah, they do that here. And then sometimes when I'm out in Missouri, I think they do that here. Uh, one, of the, one of the visitors from Kentucky uh, the other night said something about Kroger. And I know exactly what Kroger is. But there's people out here that wouldn't know what Kroger is because we don't, we don't have Kroger. We used to have Dillon's that was an affiliate of Kroger. Uh, but Walmart came in, drove all them out anyway. And so uh, now, now we've just got a few grocery stores and, and, uh, and, and there's no Kroger affiliates here. Uh, but it's kind of interesting how you begin to think about uh, places and the way things happen in those places and, and there are things about home that are very, very special. This morning, uh, the Lord helping me, I want to preach about a homecoming that is still yet to come. A homecoming that is still yet to come. There's a song that uh, our family sings together uh, sometimes when we have opportunity to sing. And sometimes we just sing it driving down the road in the, in the car. But it, the song says this, I've never been there, but it's still home to me. I've never seen it, but it's where I'm going to be. I've never walked down that street of purest gold, but I've got a better reason I long to go. Because there my loved ones all are waiting, hand in hand anticipating my arrival as they're kneeling round the throne, resting without a care where I'll never be alone. My Father lives there. That's why I call it home. The family's gathering near my final dwelling place. There's not a house there. Instead, a mansion awaits. But I won't be staying in my new room too long because you'll find me praising my Father at His throne. My Father lives there and that's why I call it home. It's an odd thing even to me and probably to you and I can't imagine how odd it is to people who don't know what we're talking about when we talk about a place being home that none of us have ever seen. And yet... Heaven is my home. I know that for a fact. That heaven is my home. I've never seen it. I've never been there. And maybe somebody right here would speak up and they'd say, well, I did read a book by this little boy or whatever. Well, I'm just telling you, I don't put a lot of stock in that book. I have another book that tells me that heaven is real. I have another book that tells me that heaven is my home. And I want to kind of just take a little bit this morning on what we call here our homecoming Sunday, whether it feels like it or not. Uh, but we, we still call it our homecoming Sunday. I want to take a little bit of time this morning and I just want to talk about home for a little bit. I'll tell you this, I sure want to go there. I sure can't wait to see it. Now, i gotta, I got to be honest too. That doesn't mean I'm looking to go in the next load. However, if that's what God has for me, I'm ready to go. I'm okay. There, there's nothing weighing on me that says, hey, uh, you don't want to go yet. No, I'd be okay with going right now because my heart has longed for heaven for a long, long time. And I'm, I'm just going to tell you, some of you know this, the older I get, the more I long for heaven. The more I long to go home. The more I long to see loved ones, but most of all, the most loved one of all, the, more I, the, the, the longer I live, the more I want to see Jesus face to face. And I want to just talk about home. Since last homecoming... Some of our family has gone home. Some of them have finally got to experience the place they longed for. <clears throat> and they were ready. 
ready to see the Savior, ready to see what heaven had to offer. I would say more than anything, ready for the change that's necessary to go home. I preached this a couple years ago during our Hope of Glory series, but the fact remains, <clears throat> you can't go home looking like what you look like right now. You just can't do it. There's got to, you, you're going to have to change. But it's not a change you do, it's a change He does. It's the putting off of this mortal and the putting on of the immortal. It's the putting off of this corruptible and the putting on of the incorruptible. It's that final aspect of our salvation we, where we are made body, soul, and spirit like our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, as He is, and get to see Him face to face. And it is true that heaven is a real place. I know that scientists have come to the conclusion that it cannot be proven, so it doesn't exist. And I say that's absurdity. They have been able to chart stars in the sky that are 400 billion miles away. It doesn't mean they've ever been there. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, whether heaven is on our charts or not, it's real. And it's a real place because the Bible says it's a real place. I want, I want to invite you to just look through some scriptures with me uh, this morning. In John chapter 6 and verse number 38. John chapter 6 and verse number 38. Let me go back and read in verse number 35. John chapter 6 and verse number 35 if you've got a red letter Bible, then these words will be written in red because they're the, they're the words of Jesus Himself. And He said in John 6, 35, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to Me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on Me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that ye also have seen Me and believe not. All that the Father giveth Me shall come to Me, and him that cometh to Me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of Him that sent me. Do you see that? Jesus said, I came down from heaven. Jesus, our Savior, spoke of heaven as it was a real place, and as it was a place that He came from. Now look with me in Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, verse 51. Luke chapter 24 verse 51 says, And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. So Jesus said in John 6, I came down from heaven. Luke said that he went back to heaven. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 1. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 1 having some sword drills in here this morning, getting ready for camp next week, I guess. Uh, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1 says, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum, we have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Are you getting the picture here? Jesus said, I came down from heaven. Luke said he went back to heaven. Hebrews says that he's sitting in heaven right now. All of these refer to it as a place. In John chapter 14 and verse number 1, he said, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. If heaven's not a real place, what's Jesus talking about place and where and all that kind of stuff? No. Heaven is a real place. Well, that brings up another question then. Where is it? Now, if we went over here to the Super Sunday activities this morning, 
And we pulled a, a five-year-old kid out of the bunch and we asked him, uh, can you tell me where heaven is? Chances are, I can tell you exactly how they're going to they're gonna answer that. They're going to make a little gesture with their hand like this and they're going to they're going to point right like that and they might even say, up there. Now where do they get that? Well, they might have heard something about it in church or Sunday school or something like that. But I'm telling you, just about any kid, whether they've been to church or not, if you ask them where heaven is, they're just almost naturally going to point up. It's, it's up there somewhere. Well, I'm a kind of a scientific person. I, I like science. I think about things. And I thought about this, that if at the same time we go ask a kid over here in Super Church this morning, uh, we go ask them where heaven is and they point up, and then at the same time a missionary in China uh, pulls one of their kids aside and says, now where's heaven? And they do the exact same thing. I would say up there, but I don't know it in Mandarin. So uh, I'll just have to say it in English. And they say up there and they point up. Do you realize that those two kids are both pointing up, but they are pointing in separate directions into the universe? You think about that? I mean, both of them seem to be pointing up, but if you're following the line on their finger to where they're pointing, they're going into the universe in two totally different directions. So where is it at? Where is it at? All right, here's the biblical answer y'all been waiting for. Studied this out a lot. Here it is. I don't know. <laughs> I know from what the Bible says about it that there's a possibility that heaven, though a literal place, is a spiritual realm that is not measurable by space, time. We do know this from the Scriptures, and the, and the Bible teaches this and makes it very clear, that there are three distinct heavens. And sometimes the Bible even says the heavens. We know of three distinct uh, um, places that the Bible calls heaven. The first thing that's called heaven is the atmosphere. So like we're talking about Earth's atmosphere is called a heaven. Um, as a matter of fact, we're, we won't take the time to turn there, but in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 25, he refers to the birds that are in heaven. He's not talking about somewhere where, with the streets of gold and everything like that. No, he's talking about flying around in the sky, in that heaven, that, that layer of atmosphere. Then beyond that, we know that the realm of the stars, which would be what we would call outer space, that's also referred to in the Bible as heaven. And an example of that would be in Isaiah chapter 13 verse 10 where he talks about the stars that are in heaven. And so that's another layer. And then we know this, there's also a celestial heaven and that is the abode of God. Now, Paul in one of his letters talks about a man. I believe it was him, Paul himself, but he talks about a man, whether in the body or out of the body, he could not tell, that got caught up to the third heaven. That's the celestial heaven, the, 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 the uh, abode of God. And what he saw there, Paul said, he wasn't allowed to talk about. He wasn't sent back from heaven with a message, hey, tell everybody what you saw there. No, it wasn't lawful for him to talk about what he saw in the third heaven but, but he, he, he got to see at least a glimpse into the abode of God. John was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day while on the Isle of Patmos. And he was caught up in the Spirit and he got to see into the heavenlies. And so if, if, I, if I had to put Scripture together and compare Scripture with Scripture, this is, this is what I've come up with. That the abode of God is beyond the starry sky. It's outside of that heaven, there's a third heaven out there. Somebody says, well, I don't believe that heaven exists because we can't see that with the Hubble telescope. Well, it would be pretty presumptuous to think we could. Man can't get there if he wanted to on his own. 
Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now there's also some other interesting verses in Scripture that if heaven is a place beyond the starry sky and beyond that heaven, there is some biblical indication that might indicate that that place resides to the north of earth. And I only say that because of some passages that refer to um, heaven being a northerly thing. And I won't take the time to go into all of that uh, this morning, but Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 13 refers to uh, that. And uh, Ecclesiastes also, there's some, other, there's some other passages that do that. The fact that I can't pinpoint exactly where it's at on a celestial universal map doesn't mean it doesn't exist because the Bible says it does. Not only that, but the Bible says that not only is it a literal place, but that it is the home of every believer. And that's what I want to look at for just a second this morning. Look at Philippians uh, chapter 3. I had, to, had you turn there, and we're already back there. Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 20. This is what Paul writes to the uh, believers in Philippi. Philippians chapter 3 verse 20. He says, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto His glorious body, according to the working whereby He is able even to subdue all things unto Himself. Now, here's you say, I don't really see a lot about what that has to do with this. Well, here's what I found in studying this passage, that when He says, for our conversation is in heaven... I had to go look that up. I wanted to know what that means. What does he mean for our conversation is in heaven? And because when I read it, here's what comes to my mind. What comes to my mind is, God hears what we say. Can you see that? For our conversation is in heaven, God hears what we say. Uh, like what, what our conversations, God's privy to. Now, there are other verses of Scripture that would indicate God does know what we say. Some of you might get a little bit scared about that. Well, let me drive it a little bit further, can I? You don't even have to say it. God knows what you think. So if we get, if we get nervous about the fact that God hears our conversations, God hears the conversations you have in your own head. He knows all about that. So I had to look that up. And what I found out is that the word conversation that our translators use um, here is a, is, a pretty, is a pretty wide word. It's used several times in Hebrews. And this is actually when I studied this passage is when I was going through Hebrews chapter 13. And the word conversation is used twice in that passage. But, but I was blown away when I looked at this Philippians 3 verse. Because what that conversation means it, is it means a manner of living... Or citizenship. And then I got into studying this a little bit more. And I was so encouraged by what I saw. Here's what Paul was doing. Paul was writing to people that lived in a city called Philippi. Philippi was a Greek city. Had its establishment in Greek culture. Even though it was conquered by the Roman Empire... They didn't lose their Greekness. They were still a very proud Greek city, uh, this city of Philippi. They had Greek lifestyle. They had Greek traditions. Everything in the city of Philippi was Greek. But they were also part of the Roman Empire, which means that every person that lived as, 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 uh, that had Philippi as its residence also enjoyed Roman citizenship. And Roman citizenship was a good thing. You had a lot of perks by being a Roman citizen. Like if you got in trouble with the law or something like that, 
There was a whole different way that you had to be tried according to the judicial system if you were a Roman citizen. You got, you got a lot of privileges. You got a lot of blessings. It was a blessing to be a citizen of Rome just like I believe it's a blessing to be a citizen of the United States of America. I'm thankful to be a citizen of the United States of America. And if you don't know this, we have blessings as citizens of the United States that the rest, the rest of the world doesn't have. We enjoy a lot of blessings because of freedoms and liberties that we have that other men paid for with their blood. And we do good to remember that. We do very well to remember that. But there were, there were great privileges to being a Roman citizen. And so here's where they were. They're living in a Greek city with a Greek way of life, but they're Roman citizens. So beyond the Greek city, they have all of these privileges and blessings that come from, from being a citizen, watch this, being citizen of a city that most of them had never been to. But that citizenship extended to them. And so Paul writes to these Christians, these aren't just citizens of Philippi, they are citizens of Philippi who have trusted Christ as their Savior. They're now Christians, and he writes to them, and they already have the understanding of their residence versus their citizenship. And what he's telling them is, he says, hey, look, our citizenship, our conversation is in heaven from whence, we also, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, look, you know what it is to live in one place and be citizens of another. I'm telling you that now that you know Christ as your Savior, heaven is your real home. You're just living here on earth. Like Philippi was to Rome, so earth is to heaven. The fact is, these Christians were going through persecutions in Philippi. It was in Philippi where Paul and Silas got thrown into the dungeon. It was Philippi that didn't care very much for the Christian ways of life and ways of doing things. And there were all kinds of problems for Christians that were in Philippi. And Paul is writing to them to remind them that, look, you, you're just strangers there. You're just sojourning there. That's not your home. Heaven is your home. And we're looking toward home. We're not looking toward the foreign land where we happen to be traveling right now. And by the way, all of the ills that will befall you won't mean anything when it's time to go home. When, when it's time to go home, none of the things that have bothered you in the past will bother you anymore. None of the persecutions will matter once it's time for you to go home. Because when it's time for you to go home, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto His glorious body according to the working whereby He is able even to subdue all things unto Himself. Don't fret about this, friend. You might have to go through some problems and difficulties while you're traveling in a foreign land, but when it's time to go home, that's not going to matter anymore. That's probably why one of my favorite songs says this. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Our trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of His dear face, all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. How about this song? This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. And with each passing day, I feel less and less at home. With each passing day, my surroundings get stranger and stranger. 
Because with each passing day, my desire is to be conformed more and more into the image of His Son. And the more conformed into Christ's image I become, the more earth seems like a foreign place. To the point that there's just not much here that really matters. Oh, sometimes we treat things like they really matter. But usually when we do, it's because we're not thinking about home. Usually when, when, we, when we get so wrapped up and so worried about earthly temporal things, it's because we're not thinking that, that soon and very soon we're going to see the King. And we're going to get to be in His presence. We're going, to get to, we're going to get to enjoy His company, not because we deserve it, but because He died for our sins and rose from the grave that you and I might have eternal life so that we could be called God's children and so that we could call His place our place. As a matter of fact, Paul said it a little bit different in Ephesians. He said to the, the believers in Ephesians, he says, Y'all just need to understand. This is my words, not his. But this is what he said. He said, y'all just need to understand. You're actually already there. Now here's what he said. You've been made to sit together with Christ in heavenly places. Positionally, I'm already in heaven. I'm just waiting on my body to be. I'm just waiting to finally get there. And what a day that will be. When my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon His face, the one who saved me by His grace. Look, I'm not going to say that the earth doesn't have things that are fun, that are entertaining. I'm not going to say that there's not joys and blessings from living this life on earth. I enjoy my family. I enjoy friendships. I enjoy church. I, I enjoy... Uh, uh, um, uh, hobbies and look there's nothing wrong with all of those things God created an earth created an earth for man to inhabit and created on that earth things for men to enjoy but if we enjoy the things of earth more than we're looking forward to our heavenly home something's out of balance something's wrong as a matter of fact Jesus said lay not for lay not uh, up for yourselves treasures on the earth he said, set your affections on things where? Above. Like, like that kid in Sunday school. Up there. I don't know if I'm pointing in the right direction or not. But there is a real place called heaven. And that's where my heart is supposed to be. I know we went through this on Wednesday night, but in the book of Hebrews, we're not seeking for an earthly city. We're not seeking for an earthly house. We're not looking to put roots down here because this is just a place where we are pilgrims and strangers. We have a home that we're looking forward to going to. And Jesus told us how to get there. He said there's only one way. And he said he was that way. He told his disciples, he said, Now let not your heart be troubled. In other words, don't, don't worry about things because I've got a plan. And my plan is I'm going to go away and I'm going to go back to my Father and there I'm going to prepare a place for you and then I'm coming back again so that wherever I am, that's where you are too. And I got news for you. Regardless of whether I ever get to see a, a gate of of solid pearl or walls of jasper or a street of clear transparent gold like the Bible says there is, if I never see a tree of life, if I never see any of those factors of a description of the new Jerusalem in the book of Revelation, heaven will be heaven if Jesus is there. That's what makes heaven heaven. And it's amazing to me that Christians can not only be material, but they can, get, they can be so material that they start looking forward to the material of heaven. 
Man, I just can't wait for all that pearl, all that jasper, all that gold. And what do you think that matters? It doesn't matter a bit. I'll tell you what makes home home. My father's there. What makes home home is my older brother is there. I'm a joint heir together with Jesus Christ, a child of God, not, not equal with the Son, but in the position of the Son because of His grace. And I get to enjoy that position because God has been merciful to me and God has been long-suffering to me. I was separated from God. Heaven was not my home. If you want to know biblical truth, I'll tell you this. There's more description in the Bible about hell than there is heaven. And I believe that's on purpose. Because God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God, does not, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And there's enough about hell in the Bible to tell us, look, it's a place of torment, it's a place of fire, it's a place of disaster, it's a place that's tragic, it's a place created for the devil and his angels. It's not a place for humanity to spend eternity and we're not, to we're not told about heaven so that we would want to go to heaven. We're told about heaven in the context that that's where God is and those that are reconciled to God will spend eternity with Him. As a matter of fact, I've read my Bible and I know this. Heaven won't always be way somewhere up there. Because God won't always be way somewhere up there. After the millennial kingdom and after Satan's final doom is pronounced, the elements are going to melt with fervent heat. I'm not going to go into all the detail of this, but I don't, I don't believe that the heaven and earth completely passes away. Uh, because there are scriptures, especially in the Old Testament, that talk about God, uh, found, God founded the foundations of the earth to be forever. But just like Noah's flood didn't destroy completely the earth and the heavens and everything in it, it just remodeled it. Those that just went on the ark trip, you know this, the flood remodeled God's creation. Well, guess what? It's coming due for another remodel. And the former earth and the former heaven are going to pass away. The elements are going to melt with a fervent heat. And there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. But in that new heaven and new earth, you go read the last two chapters of the Word of God and you'll find out that in the new heaven and the new earth, God is going to dwell with man. No more separation. No more billions of miles of outer space and vacuum between us. God is going to dwell with man and man will be his people and he will be our God. And I'm telling you, home will be home forevermore. And boy, I look forward to that. That's the homecoming that's yet to come. A home I've never been to, but it's still my home. Does everybody understand this morning that things that are happening in heaven right now are not what you see playing out on earth. I'm telling you, if, if you lived in heaven and you came down here for a visit this weekend, you would say, uh, I've gone somewhere else. And when you showed up here, those that live here would say, you're not from around here. As a matter of fact, isn't that exactly what Nicodemus said to Jesus? We, we know that thou art sent from God because no man can do the things you do. In other words, Jesus, you're just different enough. You're not from around here. Well, here's the admonishment we have in the Word of God. If that's our home, that's where we're, we belong, and that's why we're, where we're headed, listen to me. The Bible challenges us that we 
act more like we're citizens of there than citizens of here. It ought to be distinguishable. There ought to be a difference. People ought to look at us, hear us talk, watch our behavior, look at the manner of life in which we live and realize, and this is exactly why we have the word in the scripture that's in there, our conversation, our manner of life, our citizenship ought to be obvious that it's heavenly and not earthly. We need more of that. We, we, we need, the world needs to see more people that are more excited about home than they are the trip. The, the world needs to see something different in us. They need to see something different in me. My responses to difficulties, my, my, res, my, my responses to problems, and, and, and they, they need to see something in me that's like, man, that's, that's not natural around here. You, you must be from somewhere else. Well, actually, I'm from Kentucky. Transplanted to Missouri. I'm pretty sure I'm a full show me now. Pretty sure. But I really don't want either of those to qualify my identity. I want to be seen and known as a citizen of heaven because of what Jesus has done for me. Maybe there's somebody in here this morning and you don't know that heaven's your home. You, you, maybe there's never been a time in your life when you recognize that you were a sinner and your sins have separated you from a holy God and that your only hope of salvation is forgiveness that's based upon a Savior who came to this earth, lived a perfect sinless life, died on Calvary for your sin and my sin, rose from the grave, a living Savior, and returned to heaven to sit down at the right hand of God where he ever liveth to make intercession for people like you and me. And there's never been a time when somebody's ever come to him for forgiveness, that he's ever turned them away, that he's ever turned them down. But he saves, he forgives all sin for all who come to him by faith and say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. And I believe that you died for my sin on that cross and rose again to be my Savior. And I'm trusting you for salvation. And if you'll do that this morning, you can leave this building knowing heaven is your eternal destiny. That you can spend eternity with Him. I'm glad you came to homecoming, but what would be even greater than that is the knowledge that everybody that's here this morning is going to be at the homecoming that's yet to come. I'm asking you this morning, is your citizenship in heaven? Do you know that heaven's your home? Heavenly Father, I pray that you would speak to our hearts this morning.